Howdy Tubes, welcome back to the Zach Life. So what are we doing today? So I've got here in my hand a thing called a PLC, a Programmable Logic Controller. And these are basically like a little miniature computer. Now, I'd like to start off by saying if you're new to my channel and you just stumbled across this video, uh, give me a few minutes of your time to explain this to you. Don't, don't hang up on me yet. I don't want you to get sort of lost in the technical jargon and be like, I don't get it, I'm out, I'm done. These things are a, in my opinion, a totally overlooked control device, a little miniature computer, extremely useful thing that's overlooked by people like me and probably people that would be watching this video. And I want to bring this to some of y'all, if y'all if y'all could use it. So to me, this thing's kind of like an iPhone. You know, you get your first iPhone, you can't figure out how it works, you know, take you there to, to you know, to figure out how to call or text or whatever. But after a couple of days, you get that figured out, and then you finally start finding these apps that you can use, whether it's, you know, optical tachometers, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, accelerometers. And, uh, and you realize that after a, after a short period of time that the only limitations to what you can do with an iPhone is you. You know, you're the limitation. And I think that that's something similar that applies to these. So let's... Uh, Let's start off with, with a few sort of basic what's what we got going on here. You need some terminology. So the first thing you need to know that we're going to go over is, is the difference in digital and analog inputs and outputs. So a digital input is an on or an off. That's like a switch. That's like a light that you turn on and off. That's like a pressure switch or a, um, you know, whatever, toggle switch, you name it, on and off. An analog input is a variable input, like the temperature of an engine, or oil pressure, or water pressure, or battery voltage, or whatever. An analog input or output is a variable voltage, or a variable something, voltage, resistance, current, whatever. Typically analog inputs and outputs are 0 to 5 volts, or 4 to 20 milliamps, or so, or resistance. And don't let that confuse you, you can sort of figure that out when you need to. Analog is is a variable and digital input outputs are an on and an off so if we look at this PLC here if we can get this stupid uh, camera to focus okay so we have Y outputs and X inputs so X's are always inputs Y's are always outputs to gather up some of this information here and we'll kind of make all this make sense later now these over here are analog inputs, and you can see, I can't read it through the camera, but you've got a uh, voltage reading, a current reading, now, this would be like 0 to 5 volts, 4 to 20 milliamps, common, uh, I don't know what FG stands for, but you can Google it and find out. I'm, uh, I'm, a, little bit, uh, I'm a little bit behind on the analog, they're harder to program, but we'll kind of explain that later. So how does this apply to me, and how does this apply to you? How can the person that's watching this video use it? How can you benefit from it? I can't come up with every scenario. This is obviously up to you. You've got to dream up what you can do with it, just like you with your iPhone. But I'll give you some examples of the things I've done that have turned sort of ordinary things into really, really cool things. So the first applies to the tiny house, the motor home. I've got a teardrop trailer, obviously. I'm building an RV. Uh, off-grid cabins, that kind of thing. One really cool thing that you can do with these that you can't easily do with other systems is to set up a load shed. So the big drawback to solar power, off-grid, battery banks, blah, 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 is that if you want to build one robust enough that you don't have to worry about all your peripheral loads, like your air conditioner, your heater, your you know refrigerator that comes off and on, that you've got to make it very large and that becomes cost prohibitive and you can take a PLC uh, set it up with some current sensing relays so it can tell what's on and off and and basically sense your big app appliances like your plugs in your in your uh, in your bathroom where you might run a hairdryer uh, your refrigerator your heater your air conditioner and you can put logic in all that so you can get away with a much smaller inverter so that if you need to run your hairdryer it can turn the air conditioner off immediately when your hair dryer comes on or a hot plate or something. But it knows that 
you know, if your air conditioner or heater's off for just a couple of minutes, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you won't get hot or cold. The same with a refrigerator. You know, if you've got a big load running, if you've got your stove on and you're cooking, it knows it can turn the refrigerator off. But it also can be programmed to have the logic that it knows if the refrigerator stays off for more than three or four hours, that your milk's going to go bad. And so it says, you know, it keeps track of all that. It says, oh, yeah, it's been three hours. The refrigerator hasn't ran. We have to turn off the air conditioner for X amount of minutes so we can turn the refrigerator on. You get it. You, you understand what I'm saying. And that's one really cool aspect I think that's probably applicable to the RV community. Now, you can also use something like that to start and stop a generator. So one other thing I've done that's really, really cool <clears throat> is is with motorsports, whether you've got a drag car, a mud truck, a sprint car, a hot rod, a land speed record car, what, whatever you could dream up, is to take a PLC and have that PLC control everything. And I don't mean just some things, like have it control everything, like your tail light, your headlight, your <laughs> ignition switch, your fan, your fuel pump, your you know, everything. And you could have say like in, in my dragster, I got a dragster back there if you can see it. Like in my dragster, instead of having dashes on the switchboard that turn the fuel pump on and a water pump, whatever, uh, you can have basically momentary toggle switches. So you, you just click up the switch and then back to neutral to turn on or off an item, whether it be the tail light, fuel pump, etc. And you can have the PLC programmed to pick up a crank trigger input so that it automates all that stuff. So you Hit the start button, it sees engine rotation, uh, it turns on the fuel pump, you know, initially, 10 seconds later, turns on the alternator, turns on the water pump, engine gets to X amount of degrees, whatever you want, it turns on the, the fan. But of course, you've got all these momentary toggle switches, so you can override the auto logic if you need to, you know, if you want to run it without the fan or out the water pump or run the fuel pump, you know, without starting the car, you know, like, you know, check the leaks, whatever. But anyway, control all that stuff. And then <clears throat> hold this thought. We're going to completely skip because I'm scatterbrained here. I want to explain why I like PLCs better than Arduino. And I hate the word, by the way. I don't know if you heard about Arduino, but it's something that sort of um, does similar things. And, and it is is cool. I don't really like them, though. Uh, probably that's because of my ignorance of them. But they've got two big disadvantages uh, kind of two in one, and it's that you can't, there's no way to communicate from the Arduino back to the computer. So if you lose your program, you can't retrieve your program off of it, and there's no way to get information like if you've got a water temp sensor, you can't get coolant temp sensor information back from it. You know, you can't, there's no communication there. So back to the drag car. Something you can do that's the coolest thing that's ever existed in the world of drag racing or motorsports is you can take a computer and set up a screen to control your PLC. So you have a cable that just plugs into your PLC, plugs into your computer. Or you can have something like this. It's called an HMI touchscreen. Now this is all beat up, but but you get the point. You know, you've got a set of dedicated switches. It's you know you can have virtual touch switches and you can have displays. Now there's no advantage to the computer over that other than that's just sort of set up and ready to go. So you plug it in, it fires up, and you've got like a virtual dashboard. You know, if you've got a mud truck that's jacked up in the air and you want to work on the engine, you don't want to have to get up in the cab to start it. You plug your HMI in, you set it on the tire, you can hit the start button, hit the ignition button, turn the fan, the water pump, the headlights, honk the horn, whatever the heck you want to do. Read oil pressure, water temperature, and everything from, the, from the, this little handheld HMI. Now, I don't care if you go to a million-dollar drag race, if you've got a crappy old car <laughs> that you can plug a HMI into or give a, I, I don't understand networking, but you can actually give those like an IP address with Wi-Fi. You probably can do all this stuff over like an app-based deal. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, you got a crappy old car to a million-dollar drag race, and you show up and you can plug an HMI into your car and honk the horn and crank it up with a, with a touch screen under the under the under the hood, it's just about the coolest thing that, that exists. Now I know some of y'all are saying, "Hey, I've got an RV. I don't care about hot rods. I don't care about race cars." And I get that, but I'm trying to use them as an example of how you can do things that are that are not just sort of, in my terminology, a level one 
automation like a thermostat. You know, your, this doesn't turn your air conditioner on when it gets up to a certain temperature, but it's sort of like a Wi-Fi control thermostat. It turns my air conditioner down to a certain temperature when it knows I'm so close to home or at a predetermined time. It's not just that it turns off your refrigerator when you turn on your hair dryer so you don't trip out your inverter, but it knows that if you run your hair dryer for more than three hours, it's got to turn it off so your milk doesn't go bad. And these are sort of some of the examples of, of things like that that, uh, that, that, take, that take some imagination sort of, sort of to come up with, say, you know, I, need, I have this problem and I need to be able to fix it. And anyway, I hope some of these examples can, can help you with issues like that, whether it be race cars or, or tiny houses and off-grid problems or, or, or heavy industrial machinery or, or what have you. Another thing you can do in your street rods and hot rods is to have a variable engine coolant temperature control. You know, obviously your PLC turns your fans off and on, but you can have a, a couple of different parameters at what temperature it wants you to turn the fans off and on. And say for instance, it's 50 degrees outside. You're sitting right on a stoplight. It's less of a problem to get your engine 210 degrees than it is if it's 105 degrees outside and you've been running 90 mile an hour down the road because of heat soak. And so when it's cool outside, maybe your temperature threshold's 215 degrees. You know, that's the maximum temperature you want your engine to get, and that's the point the fans come on. But if it's 105 degrees outside, it's going to turn the fans on at 180, because if you've been flying down the road and you pull up there at a stop sign, the heat soak of the engine may cause your coolant temperature to climb rapidly after you stop. hope that makes sense. That's kind of a thing that, that sort of isn't a, you, you have to, what am I trying to say? You have to make up that problem to create the solution. But once the solution is created, you fix the problem that you never really thought you had. I know that sounds really stupid, but I hope you get what I'm saying. So how does this apply to me? What am I going to specifically do with my PLC in my motorhome? And that's two things. It's going. I'm going to control the generator and I'm going to control the step. Now, if you didn't watch my previous video, and sorry I hadn't had a video in like two months, but a couple of months ago, if you go to my previous video, the, the step is pneumatic. It sits on a couple of, of air cylinders that, that brings it in and out. And it's going to be controlled by the PLC and then through a little pneumatic valve that uh, the PLC controls the valve, the valve controls the, the air cylinders. Um, kind of a a, a, a thought experiment or whatever, what I'm going to do with this PLC to control the step uh, couldn't really be done with any, in any other way and I think it's kind of neat to think about. But what I want to do is I'm going to have two switches. I'm going to have a switch that's basically hooked, if you don't understand how the brakes on the truck works, basically hooked to the parking brake valve so that when that sends air to the parking brakes to release them, uh, it'll be a switch. And basically it's like a switch on a parking brake and then it's going to have a switch back by the door. And what I wanted to do is when you release the parking brakes, it pulls the step up. You set the brakes, the step goes down. But I wanted to be able to override that with a switch, like if you got the brakes, you know, unset, somebody needs to run outside, you know, you can hit the switch by the door and pull the step down. But I still wanted to be able to control it by the parking brake. Say if somebody forgets and leaves the step down, the switch down, you just simply set the brakes and release them. Follow what I'm saying here. I know that's hard to explain, but I wanted both switches, both control inputs, to be able to override each other, and neither of the two take precedence over the other. So whichever input was given last, whether it be the parking brake, or the switch by the door, wanted, I wanted that one to be the one that, that took control. So regardless of where you're at on either end, you can bring the step up, you know, if you're in the cab or at the back, you can bring the step up or down. Now the other thing I'm gonna control is my generator. If you hadn't watched my generator film, uh, my YouTube video, it's a 353 Detroit, gross oversized, and we kinda explained why that was, but it, uh, it doesn't have any kind of control logic. It doesn't have any kind of electronics. It's got actually two mechanical levers on it. You know, one's like stop and run and the other's idle and high speed. 
Now my generator has got a large alternator on it so I can actually start it and have it idle and it'll charge the batteries without having to have it go to high speed to actually run the generator head. And I wanted to have a toggle switch like I explained earlier in the race car is a momentary up or down, you know, on, on, off, on. Uh, to be able to control the generator so that you could put multiple switches throughout the coach, like one in the dash, you know, one out by the generator, one on the control panel, maybe one in the bedroom, to control it. So unlike a three or four way switch or whatever, you could you could do anything from any switch. You know, you could start it at the front, kill it at the back, etc. Now I've got five inputs that I wanted to be able to control to the generator, five, five commands, I should have said, to the generator with one switch. And that's going to be, you push up and it starts it, it actually cranks it and starts it, uh, which it'll be at idle. Uh, you click up the switch again and it'll go like to high speed. You click the switch up and hold it up for a few seconds and release it, it'll go back to idle. You click it down and it kills it, or you click while it's running, you click it down and hold it for more than like seven seconds, I forgot what the program said. And it'll go into what I want to call a recharge mode. And that's basically so you can start it, put it in recharge mode. It'll idle and recharge the batteries like if you leave, like you're camping somewhere and you're going to go ride four-wheelers. You crank it up, put it in recharge mode. You go ride four-wheelers. When you come back, it's killed the generator after the batteries got to a certain uh, charge percentage. And then you don't have to listen to the generator run or it doesn't have to run any longer than is necessary. So before we get in there and start programming, there is there is some information that you need to have so you can sort of follow when we start. And we'll sort of describe a little bit more as we go. So the programming language is called Ladder Logic. And that is actually the, the schematic uh, drawings that have been used for years and years and years. Like even in the old days of the elevators, uh, you could actually take like their programs and put them in a PLC or their their schematic excuse me in a PLC like this and it would work just like the uh, just like the relay controlled elevators by the way if you like stuff like this electrical mechanical stuff you need to go look up relay controlled elevators because that's something I think is really cool and something I kind of geek out on so anyway there'll be two outer lines that run up and down and this is sort of like a virtual circuit that's inside the the PLC it's sort of like a positive on one side negative on the other now this isn't labeled this is just virtual remember it isn't real uh, that virtual power supply you know if you have a line that went from one to the other it would be a virtual short and so you'll have like a switch and a coil that goes between the two power supply lines and that's a virtual coil of a relay or a timer or whatever now X well, the number behind it is the input, X0, X1, X2, X1000, you know, 1, if you got a 1,000 inputs. Uh, the Y is the actual physical output. It's actually what trips the, the actual physical relay. The uh, actual, you know, Y0, if you power Y0 in the virtual coil in the ladder logic, it actually turns on the relay. The relay goes click. If you take a coil, instead of a Y, you put a T in it. That's a virtual timer, and you'll have a like a, a T, and then after that you'll have a letter that designates the amount of time, like a K is a tenth of a second. So you might have like a coil that says T1, that's timer 1, you say T1, K6. So that's the timer 1 activates after six tenths of a second. Uh, an M is a virtual relay. It's just like a real relay. You can have coils, you can have contacts, but it, it, it's not real, it's just virtual in the program. Um, there's a little bit of, of a programming language that you can see, say if you put a PLS in front of anything, in, in front of a coil, I'm, excuse me, like an output coil or whatever, that PLS gives a instantaneous, like a click, like a, like a, like a you know, whatever, when you, when you power it, it's like click, click. You know, it doesn't stay on. It just trips on, trips off. There's many, many other um, little programming logic sets of letters that you can use to do different things. Uh, there's no use in going over them. We're not going to use them. And there's more than you can memorize. If you need to get into more complicated programming like that, you just simply have to download a, a XL 
you know, cheat sheet and you can have them on in front of them and use what you need to. Um, is that it? I think that'll be enough to get started. Let's go do it. So here is how I am temporarily powering this so we can program it and use it. This is a laptop charger. It was 19 volts. This is 24, uh, but I think 19 was plenty to power it. Okay, here's the program I use is GX Developer. This program looks much like it was written in the 90s, and it probably was. Uh, it's a old looking program, but it works perfectly fine. Uh, let's see, number one. So, the programming I'm going to do is digital only. Now, analog programming is more complicated, but I don't want it to scare you. It's not anything you can't figure out. But I'm, I can stumble through it, but I'm not good enough at it really to teach you, and I'm not set up with this PLC to, to program it because this, you know, my, this PLC is digital only. If, if, if you want to learn that, you can get on YouTube, and, and, and there's lots of good videos to explain it to you much better than I could. But uh, to sort of stumble through what you'll see, you'll have an input like you know X1 or whatever. And that input will be, will have a number beside it. And that number will be the voltage, like 1.037 volts or whatever. And the switch that you program will come on or go off, depending on if it's normally closed or open, at that voltage threshold. And the easiest way to program something, say you want a set of coolant fans to come on at 180 degrees, is plug your laptop in the end of the PLC, lead, read live uh data, start the car, bring the car up to whatever temperature you want the fans to come on at, measure it with a thermal gun or whatever, car gets to 180 degrees, read the voltage, the voltage is you know 1.735 volts, and then you know 1.753 volts is a voltage that you want to put in your switch to turn your fans on. Okay, so here is a program I have already written for the generator. This would be much too complex for me to be able to walk you through as I wrote it. I'm not going to explain right now how this works, but I will at the end of the video. If you're interested in seeing actually how this program breaks out and works, we'll go over it uh, basically after the video's over at the very end. So our step program will have two inputs. That'll be X4 and X5 because X0, 1, and 2, and 3 are used in the generator program. And the output will be uh, Y3. So let me just do some programming here and then we'll sort of go back and explain what I'm doing. So we'll hit F5. That will be an open coil for X4. We want a application instruction for a, P, for a pulse PLS. And we want that pulse to trigger the coil for M5. Now, M5 is a virtual relay. And this is just a, simply a relay that you're used in the programming. They're just like an actual relay, except they don't exist. They're just, they're just here in logic only. Now, what this will do is when X5 is energized, you will have a short momentary pulse to the coil of M5. That will cause the relay of M5 to basically blink. Now right here, we're going to do almost the same thing. We'll hit Shift F5. Here instead of Shift F5, I should have hit F6. And that's why it put a vertical line and it put the wrong normally open instead of normally closed switch there. I'll fix that in a minute and explain the difference in the two. Now why did it put that in there? I want to delete the vertical line. All right, now we're going to do basically the same thing with the with the X5 here. Okay, so we have two inputs, X4, X5. This will be the toggle switch and the switch for the parking brakes. Either of those, both on or off, will cause a pulse. 
Now what are we going to do with this pulse? So what we're going to do is do a couple of latching circuits here. So let me draw this out and then we'll explain what's going on. So we'll ha we have an open switch of M5. Uh, let's see, a coil of M relay number nine. Here we'll have an open of M nine. All right, we're going to click uh, draw line. We want a line here. And then we want a line here. Okay, here we want a closed, normally closed coil of M8. Again, this should have been M7, right. not M9. I correct it later. Normally closed coil of M9. Delete vertical line. Now, when you get something like this put together, you must convert it. And what this does is it tells you if there's any issues in the programming, and it, it sort of unifies everything in a way that there won't be a miscommunication when this program is, is, is actually put onto the PLC. So let's explain really quickly kind of what we've going on here. Give you an idea, something to follow along. X4 will be the switch from the parking brake. It's either on or off. And I made a mistake here. This is supposed to be a normally closed. Let's reconvert that. Turns it white. So what have we got going here? Um, anytime X4, which is a switch from the parking brake, is flipped on or off. When it's flipped on, you get a pulse to M5. When it's flipped off, you get a pulse to M6. This pulse, M5 and M6, these would be the contacts, these would be the coils. These contacts will, for a short moment, energize the coil of relay M9. When the coil of M relay M9 is energized, the contact is closed. Now this contact will travel through both of these normally closed switches and it will keep itself on. This is called a latching circuit. So an, a momentary energizing of M5 or M6 will latch this circuit. It will stay latched until either X5 is turned on or turned off and this short pulse to M7 or M8 will open because these are normally closed circuits, will open this circuit from M7 or M8 and unlatch it. Now I'm going to come down here and basically do the inverse of this. Now then, these will latch depending on the last input, either on or off, will latch to M, M9 or M10 will latch. So now all we have to do and then this will be the final output coil and the output relay on the actual board we're going to use is uh, Y3. Uh, draw, I'm already there. Okay, we're going to convert. Now, let's put this on the PLC and see if it'll work. Okay, got the PLC up and running. So we will go to online, right to PLC, program main, you gotta click main. Now we can go over here and click 
monitor and this will t this will show you um, switches and coils are energized and which ones are not. So here is X4. This will be the switch that, that comes from the parking brake. This will be the switch. It's actually the manual toggle switch at the door. Now X4 is off but this is a normally open switch. This is a normally closed. That's why even though X4 is off, it's this, this switch here is normally closed and it is powering sending power to the uh, Pulse M6. So here I will trigger X4 and you can see what happens. The X4 lights up, the normally open X4 turns off. Same with X5. Okay, so I made a small mistake. I had these two backwards. I fixed that, reloaded the program back on the PLC and we're back to where we were. I've zoomed out so you've got a better view of the entire program. So we'll go right up here. I may be off camera. I can't see. We'll click the um, monitor. The PLC is still hooked to the computer and you can see real time what's going on. So X4 parking brake sensor. I wish you could relabel these. Probably some programs you can for what the actual switch is. Uh, the parking brake sensor now, both of these are off because neither have a wire hooked up. They're not connected. But these switches here are normally closed switches. So you have to energize X4 to turn off this switch. Same with X5. These, it, make sure you understand the normally open, normally closed. Now, when we trigger X4 either on or off because we've got a normally open, normally closed, will have a pulse through either M5 or M6. They are, they are basically added here. So an instantaneous pulse from M5 or M6 will latch this logic. It will latch this relay. On the contrary, an instantaneous pulse from M8 or 7 will unlatch this program. Vice versa, this is the inverse of this. So whichever, either X4 or X5, that is last switched, either on or off, whichever changes position, will, will latch its program. Now this logic would be for the parking brake, this logic would be for the switch at the door. Now, whichever of these switches are latched, M9 or 10, you will have the, the, the contact for that latch circuit will be turned on. So this is M9. So M9 makes X4 now the priority or the actual controlling switch. So if I if I switch now that we're on X4, if I switch X4 off and on, which I will, it's actually turning off and on. Y3, the actual relay. And I don't know if you can hear the relay clicking. Now if I touch X5, it all switches to X5. Now what's cool about this program is say X5, which X5 is a switch, you switch the switch on, which would eject the, uh, which would ex The point I was trying to make, which I felt so miserably saying in the video, was I wanted to drive home the point that neither the parking brake nor the manual switch have precedence over each other. The input signal that is used is simply the last input signal given, whether it's the releasing of the parking brake, the setting of the parking brake, the manual switch being flipped up or flipped down. The last command is the one that is obeyed. All right, here is a PLC mounted and where it's going, I sort of run these wires through this, uh, sorry this is a difficult video, run these wires through a piece of heat shrink and they'll simply run up into this box and all my junctions will be in there. Here is the actual air control valve. It's going to control the step. There'll be another couple of these for the air suspension and some others. Um, it's kind of noisy right now. I've got a 12 volt power supply here, like a laptop power supply I've been triggering this with.
So I had to make a little bit of a modification to my air control system and the problem is that valve either in up or down position keeps air on those cylinders and if you jump on the step I guess it flexes a rod enough that the seal on the inside of the cylinders leaks. When you jump on the, the step it causes air to bypass through the cylinder and come out on the valve over there and it goes every time you jump on it out that valve on the inside of the coach and so what I'm going to do is buy another little uh, solenoid valve that basically cuts the air off to that three-way control valve 